Welcome back. Here we're going to, um, I'm going to go over um, Newton's third law and the first part of section 5.5. Now note that um, I uploaded a PowerPoint that goes through, um, two of them actually, uh, one that goes through the first three sections of chapter 5 and the second one that goes, kind of picks up here, um, you know, re recaps um, sections 2 and 3 or section 3 and 4 a little bit and then um, goes into five. So um, there's a bit more detail on the third law there. So um, I'm, I'm going to try not to repeat what's there. These, these things should complement each other. Um, so just to recap, Newton's first law was a law of inertia, something that's uh, an object that's moving in a straight line or, or has no, an object that has no force is acting on it, or the net force acting on it is zero, is going to travel in a straight line at constant velocity. If, if unbalanced force acts on it, it's going to undergo an acceleration. That's the second law. Third law is that when two objects interact, the force exerted by one on the second is the same as the force exerted by the second on the first. This is what we see in this diagram here. So um, this is true whether you're pushing a shopping cart um, or you're pushing on a wall that's not accelerating and the shopping cart is accelerating. Um, the forces don't cancel each other because remember the acceleration is proportional to mass. There's other stuff going on. They're not exactly the same objects. So even though there's equal and opposite reaction, you're not going to have the same motion for both part for both bodies that are interacting. So um, let's let's look at these for a moment. Um, we're going to look at normal forces. Um, normal forces are going to be really important uh, moving forward for us, and um, especially if you go into mechanical or civil engineering or any branch thereof, um, they're really key. Normal comes from perpendicular. Um, so let's put that down. Normal means perpendicular to the surface being studied. Okay, so over here I've got a pic I've got a, a diagram of a wall, and I'm going to push on that wall. I'm going to apply a force to that wall. Here's my force. All right, and I'm going to call that force F1. All right, now. That wall responds to that force um, with a normal force. The wall pushes back. So the wall pushes back with a normal force. And to make sure, just to um, make that more clear, hopefully, we're going to call that an N for normal. So the normal force is opposite the direction and same magnitude as the applied force. Okay, so F1 is exerted by my hand. The, res the wall responds by pushing back on my hand with a force N1. Now, we're going to think about this in a couple of ways, but the first and easiest way to start it, to get your head around this, if it's a new concept, is what would happen if the wall didn't push back? Well, that would be an unbalanced force, so the wall would accelerate, right? So you basically be pushing, either be pushing the wall or pushing your hand through the wall. So for there to be an equilibrium where your hand is not pushing through the wall or pushing the wall, the wall must be pushing back, and it must be pushing back equally, or else it would be accelerating your hand back. All right, so 
from a negative point of view, view um, that's one way to think about it. We're going to think about it another way in just a minute. Um, so, if um, a little PowerPoint reference here, if you go to the PowerPoint in um, week six, slide. Um, I think it's between 10 and 12, those slides. There's some pictures there that should help. So a way to think about this in the positive sense, as opposed to the way we just thought about what would happen if, you know, if there wasn't um, a force pushing back, is think of atoms as balls on, the, on springs. And the bonds between the atoms are springs. And we know this sort of happens because the elastic interactions, when you when you when you compress a piece of metal or you bend a piece of metal a little bit, it bends but then it springs back. It bends and it springs back. Oh yeah, sure, eventually we can deform it. But until you get to that point, there's an elastic area. Um, think of a rubber band. You can stretch it. And then it'll go back, stretch it, and go back. Okay, those. Now we see that in a macroscopic level, but in a microscopic level, that's happening too. Those bonds between the atoms are stretching or compressing in response to an applied force. So, if you if you think of if you think of atoms in a solid like um, a huge arrangement of springs and when I was learning this this is what really helped me because I the idea of a wall pushing back on your hand just made no sense at all to me um, when you apply a force, you compress, if I'm pressing on it, or expand, if you had a handle on the wall and you're pulling it out, um, or expand those springs. Changing their their uh, arrangement from their equilibrium position requires a force. And the, the um, it requires a force to displace them, and they're unstable there, and they're going to be pushing back, trying to get back to their equilibrium position. Okay? Just like um, moving a spring from its equilibrium position. Okay, so let's recap. We have a force applied to the wall. The wall reply, the wall responds with a normal force that's equal and opposite. Okay, so now what happens when that force that's applied is not perpendicular? Is that normal to the wall? Well, I think I think you can figure out the answer to that. Based on what we've done in the past, here's our wall again. And um, I'm going to put that black. And I'm going to apply a force. 
at an angle this time. Uh, I'm going to have my F1 uh, come up like this. Okay, this is going to be F1. And then my N1. Let's see, I didn't get this to look right from here. Like that. It's going to be my N1. And that should have a vector sign. Vector sign. Okay. Now, in this situation, the applied force needs to be broken into its components. Okay. So, um, the normal force. generated by the wall uh, responds to the component the component of F1 perpendicular to the wall. Okay? So F here is going to have it's going to have a x and a y component, All right? So this is F one x. This is F one y. So. The normal force generated by the wall responds to the component, which is here, F1, um, X. Now, that up here is going to be this guy. And I put N in a very bad place. So let me fix that. This is N. Um, N1, which responds to N1, which responds to F1. But the normal force exerted by the wall, the normal force is perpendicular to the wall, is out here. That's not straight. Try that one more time. Going from here to there. Okay. This is your standard normal force that's perpendicular to the surface of interest. Okay. Well, what about what about um, F one Y? Well, F one Y is acting parallel to the surface. The wall doesn't respond to that in the way we discussed it here. So um, F1Y, um, so the response of the wall to um, the parallel component which is F1Y is the friction force which we're going to symbolize with a, a cursive F. Okay, so this, the Y component of this normal force acting from here to here is going to be the friction force. All right. The friction force. Let's say you're you're pushing on this wall with your hand. Um, the friction force resists.
resists um, your hand slipping up the wall. If the coefficient of friction is high enough, it'll prevent your hand from slipping up the wall. If it's not high enough, then your hand will just slip up more slowly than it would if there was no friction. Okay, so if it's at an angle, which is often normally going to be, you're going to have two components of the applied force. The one perpendicular to the wall is going to be the normal force, and that's going to be responded to as a normal force by the wall. The other component parallel to the wall, as friction has to respond to that. Okay, so also note that the force of gravity has equal and opposite reactions. So um, just, just looking at this real quickly, if we have earth and some object, say the cat falling to earth, okay, this, um, this object right here, so the mass of the object, the mass of the object times gravity of the earth equals F little g. Okay, so this is the force exerted by Earth on the object. There is also a force exerted on the Earth by the object. Okay. We call that F with a big G, just because. That's the mass of the Earth times the gravity of the object. All right. This is the force um, exerted by the object. on the earth. And um, so the earth accelerates toward an object as the object accelerates toward the earth. It's just that the earth is so much more massive that um, the acceleration of the earth toward the object is negligible compared to the acceleration of the object towards the earth. Okay, so we don't usually think of that. Okay, so um, Let's, uh, let's pop through um, a quick example here. Um, so, man in an elevator. Which is accelerating. upward. Okay. Find the normal force that the floor of the elevator exerts on the man. And find the normal force the man exerts on the floor of the elevator. All right, so. Let's, uh, let's sketch this out. So, 
here's our elevator. Okay, and we have a person in said elevator. We have weight acting downward. And this is a force exerted on the elevator by Earth. Okay, and then there's some normal force upward. Okay, and this is exerted by the floor. And then to use a different color. Um, there's an acceleration. We're told that this is accelerating. This is the acceleration of the elevator. And we're given some numbers for this. We're told that the mass of the man is um, 75.0 kilograms. And that the acceleration of the elevator is 2.00 meters per second squared. Now this is a mass, right? This is not going to change. The man's mass is not going to change. So we're going to go to free body diagram and there's only two forces on it, right? We have, we have the normal force acting up and the weight that's acting down. So we have N and W. Okay, now remember the mass mass does not change. But weight depends on acceleration because it's a force. Okay, so. Alrighty, so we're going to figure out the net force in this. Net force is the difference between the two forces acting on the object. So. The net force is the um, same as the sum of the forces, which is N, so we take positive being up, minus um, Mg. And this is weight. Now, um, F net equals the mass times the acceleration. So mass times the acceleration equals N minus Mg. And if we uh, just do a little algebra, we get an expression for the normal force equals the um, mass times the acceleration plus the mass times gravity. And we've got those. So that's 75 times uh, 2. My units are all straight, so I'm just putting the numbers in here. 75 times 9.81. So the normal force is 150 plus 736 all in newtons, and this is 886 newtons. Okay, this is exerted by elevator um, on the man. Okay, so the normal reaction force and the force the man exerts downward on the floor of the elevator must be equal in magnitude and opposite direction. So the man must also be exerting 
um, the same force on the floor. Okay, now, if the man was standing on the bathroom scale in the elevator as it was accelerated, it would register this as a larger weight because it's a greater force than as if it was standing still. Right, so um, another little thing to note here. Note the direction of the velocity or the direction the elevator is moving doesn't matter. The direction of the velocity does not matter. Right? Because acceleration is a change in velocity. So whether he's the elevator is going up and then he's going up faster, or whether it's going down and decelerating, right? If you're going down and decelerating, it's still an acceleration in the positive direction. So the acceleration could be causing an increase in velocity. I mean, you could, the velocity could be going in the same direction as the acceleration or the opposite. You're going to get the same result. Okay. So, um, hope that helps. And I'm going to stop there. And um, the second part of this, we're going to take up the special case of, of tension and ropes and chains and that kind of stuff. All right. Bye for now.